Good evening. 2021 is the 700th anniversary of the year when Dante Alighieri left this world for the undiscovered country from whose born no traveler returns, as Hamlet says in his most famous soliloquy. And quoting Shakespeare in this occasion is not accidental. For Dante, in more than one way, is the Shakespeare of Italy. Of course, the differences between the two are immense, but the breadth, the breadth and the importance of their heritage allows them to share the equal importance that each of them has had in their respective country. Shakespeare lived 300 years later than Dante, when the English language was already fully established. Still, according to scholars and linguists, Shakespeare reshaped the English language and gave it a unique and distinct character. And by shaping the language, he also ended up shaping the character of a nation, the character of England. We live in times strengthened from strange to stranger, of cancel culture, anti-European history, and sentiment hostile to European ethnicity. Whatever one may say or think, the fact remains that language is the blood of culture and national language is the cultural blood of the nation. Still, when Dante was born, the Italian language did not have a structure, a standing, a personality, we could say, that one could identify as, as the symbol of the nation. Which is why we can say without exaggeration that language-wise Dante is the Shakespeare of Italy. In fact, Dante's Italian could be more accurately described as Tuscan or Florentine, Florentine because Italy became a united nation only in 1861 and at the time only about 3%, 3% of the population approximately could be identified as Italian speakers. The first capital of a united Italy was Turin in Piedmont and two Milanese researchers, the Venosta brothers, traveled through Italy to study how to integrate peoples who until then belonged to different nations altogether. In their interesting published report, they related that when talking to each other along, along the streets of Naples, people thought that they were foreigners speaking English. But returning to Dante, although he wrote poetry, chronicles and treatises, he is mostly and better known for his divine comedy, in which he describes an, Im an imaginary voyage through hell, purgatory and paradise. In Hell and Purgatory, Dante is accompanied by the Latin poet Virgil, whereas in Paradise he is accompanied by the love of his life, Beatrice, or Beatrice, as they say, the impersonation of perfect womanhood, whom, whom I mean Beatrice, D Dante never married, for she was married to someone else. My special connection with this anniversary, if I can dare say it, has to do with the fact that a few years ago the government of Tuscany published my dictionary of Dante's Divine Comedy, a situational dictionary, the equivalent of my Shakespearean situational dictionary. The Dante's Dictionary cannot, be, cannot but be in Italian and its translated title, translated into English, is Our Daily Dante, 3500 Ways of Getting Away with It with Dante. In fact, Similar, just as with Shakespeare, many Dante's lines have become modes of saying in Italian, and my dictionary expands the range of Dante's incisive quotations to fit particular situations that we may actually encounter in our daily lives. When comparing Dante with Shakespeare, one more observation I think is necessary. Shakespeare displayed his genius during the times of Queen Elizabeth I, the daughter of King Henry VIII and of his second wife Anne Boleyn, whom Henry had decapitated on very questionable charges. We won't go into this. However, the important point is that Shakespeare lived in a time when the nationalist spirit, at least in the major nation, 
of Europe had already been established. I am thinking about England, France, Spain particularly. Shakespeare's plays are therefore nationalistic. They embody, they embody national pride. England bound in with the triumphant sea whose rocky shore beats back the envious siege of watery Neptune, and so on. Dante makes reference to Italy, but rarely and in a geographical sense, such as in the lines I serve Italia di Dolore Ostello, Nave senza cocchiere in gran tempesta, which can be translated, of course, the rhythm being lost, Italy in the condition of a servant, host to pain, ship without a captain during a storm. Now, the Divine Comedies is a self-standing masterpiece populated by a large number of characters, and in order to better understand the poem, not only as poetry but its historical context, it, it, helps, it helps to know something of the political and social condition of Florence during Dante's lifetime. Furthermore, Dante positions or finds all sorts of interesting characters in Hell, in Purgatory and Paradise, and I couldn't possibly mention even a small number of them in this video. However, however many, whether in Paradise or in Hell, lived and died during Dante's time. Therefore, describing the Florence and Tuscany of the 1300 and some of these characters may I hope bring the Divine Comedy to, from, from, an, from, from an ethereal plane down to the plane of the earthlings, the earthlings that, that populated Tuscany at the time and Italy uh, during his time. Saying that the political conditions of Tuscany were complicated would be a euphemism. And to do justice to history, many episodes of this series would be needed. I can only extract some important characters and events knowing full well the limitations, but knowing as well, knowing as well that to add more would render this humble effort of mine unmanageable. I intend to give the willing and patient listeners some ideas, some hints, some perceptions of what life in Florence was like between 1265 and 1321, that is, during Dante's lifespan. Now, when Dante says that Italy is in the condition of a servant, he refers to the disputes, the diatribes, the fights and the battles involving different sets or factions of Florence in an Italy which was emerging from the Middle Ages. And in this Italy emerging from the Middle Ages, factions were connected in different ways to the two contending great powers of the time, the Vatican and the Empire, meaning specifically the Western Roman Empire, whose emperors were in Germany, and the Vatican, whose popes were in, in Rome. To strike again another comparison, England was also a feudal system, but it was based, however, on the overarching authority of a king. In England as well, there were of course battles among factions of the nobility and rebellions of feudal lords, out of one came out, for example, the Magna Carta, whose 800th anniversary, by the way, occurred in 2015. But a generally accepted system of government by the times of Shakespeare had been in place in England for at least, for at least 400, 500 years. In Italy the conditions were remarkably different and remarkably more complicated. With much simplification, I will only attempt to give the flavor, so to speak, of what was going on at the time. In previous episodes of this series, which you can find, which you can find on my website, yourdailyshakespeare.com, we saw the foundation of the Western Roman Empire by Charlemagne. And Charlemagne, we could say, is and was symbolic of the structure and consolidation of the feudal system, wherewith or whereupon, feudal lords and families divided among themselves the administration and, in practice, the ownerships, the ownership of large territories. These territories were further uh, subdivided in turn in, and reassigned to the administration and controls of various vassals, as they were called. 
One of the most important feudal families in Italy were the Canossas, whose most famous representative was the Countess Matilde di Canossa. As you, as you can see from the image, the lands under her control were, relatively speaking, immense. You can see that her feudal domains included not only Florence, but also Arezzo, Pisa, Lucca, Mantua, Perugia, Siena, and more. Therefore, one may ask the question, how did all these important towns become independent? To the point of fighting independent not only, but to the point of fighting each other, as was the case of Florence, fighting with Arezzo, with Pisa, with Lucca, and so forth. The answer is that they didn't. They did not, in the sense of each city having had its own war of independence, in the style, for example, of the United States against England. Rather, it was a case of evolving times, naturally forcing the changes. Now, changes can be either positive or negative. For comparison, today, the First Amendment of the Constitution guaranteeing freedom of expression is theoretically extant. But the social media revolution has created new challenges for the ruling elites regarding the control, the control of public opinion. And not to deviate from the subject, but the challenge is met by using censorship and centralizing the control of social media in the hands of people we cannot even name without being censored ourselves. Because, because, for good or for bad, social media can effectively challenge and compete with the other traditional media, which are but now the discredited servants of the deep state. And the answer of the deep state to the challenge is shameless censorship by the social media, which has become another servant of the deep state. Now, in the context of this presentation and to strike a comparison, the Florentines probably did not even realize that the feudal system had evolved into an organization of city-states of which Florence was one. Just as, just as, at least in the Western world, the majority of citizens do not even realize that the First Amendment about the freedom of speech has gone the way of all flesh. Now back to Matilde, to Matilde of Canossa and her feudal, her feudal domains. In a scale and proportion suitable to the times around the year 1000, new technologies were developed in manufacturing, agriculture, and naturally marketing. To quote one, for example, the wheel, the plow in agriculture, as well as the processing of wool and the associated manufacturing of clothes, plus mining, expanded trade, especially with the East, the original Silk and Road Initiative, we could say, to make a modern reference. For such great transformation, the political and administrative structures associated with classical feudalism were no longer suitable. After all, after all, feudalism was born as a means and a system to protect local inhabitants from the hordes of invading barbarians, at least in principle. Hence the castle, and the castles that still speak to us of that now distant past. Therefore, the transformation of the domains of Matilde of Canossa into the new political system of the city-states was gradual and inevitable. Meaning, meaning that in time the cities acquired a practical de facto independence, though all still formally participating in the nominal dual power structure consisting of the Emperor of the Western Roman Empire on one side and the Pope of Rome on the other. In practice, the city-states were independent and essentially self-administered. Each had its own administrative structure and for the purpose of this, of this episode we will only look at Florence. However, however, this acquired independence did not mean that strife, turmoil and bloodshed were magically eliminated. But, and this was a key point that would have important consequences, consequences on Dante's life, when she died, Matilde left, Matilde left the Tuscan part of her huge feudal domain to the Pope. But, the emperors of Germany invalidated Matilde's will because her feudal authority derived 
and was a concession of the emperor, not of the pope, and her feudal possessions were granted to her by the emperor as well, and not by the pope. This conflict between the empire and the Vatican was to have extended and bloody consequences and even affected Dante, who was banned from Florence and never returned. For there arose two competing parties in Tuscany, one called the Guelphs, who, roughly speaking, belonged to the party of the Pope, and the other, the Ghibellines, who, roughly speaking, belonged to the party of the Emperor. Dante was a Ghibelline, showing clear preference for the German Emperor rather than the Vatican Popes. In fact, Dante puts at least two Popes in hell. But Guelphs and Ghibellines were not the only division. The two parties fighting against each other from Guelphs and Ghibellines evolved into Black Guelphs and White Guelphs, of course no reference, no reference to skin color. Eventually the parties of the Whites and the Blacks were involved in a, into a bloody dispute where now the Whites were associated with, a family, the, with the family of the Cherkis and the Blacks with the family of the Donatis. Cherkis and Donatis being two prominent families around whom the competing parties grouped themselves. But nothing is ever simple in history. I mentioned the formation of the city-states caused, or better said, prompted by the development of trade and, uh, and technology. The governing instrument of the fledgling city-state was a parliament. And at the beginning, the parliament was similar to the classical Athenian parliament in which all the citizens participated. But, as the city grew, the government was transformed, like then, like now, into what we call, with a euphemism really, a representative democracy. The representative body was formed by the noblemen of Florence. It was called the Council of the One Hundred, who, I mean the 100, were however the same feudal lords who also still kept their own castle and domain outside the walls, outside the city walls. These noblemen now turned democratic were as autocratic as ever. They dominated roads, imposed tributes and taxes of all sorts, and as well as extortion, extortions on the, on the growing trade. And they themselves competed against each other for prestige and supremacy. They too were themselves divided into Guelphs and Ghibellines and never could form a united front against the growing power of a Florence as, as a city-state. In fact, in fact, the first wars that Florence conducted as a city-state were against one or more of these feudal lords who essentially held the city at ransom. Eventually, there was a compromise. Some feudal lord swore allegiance to Florence, and in return, Florence acknowledged their titles, their castles, and their possessions. But, but they had to reside in Florence for at least four months during a year. Those who didn't comply had their castles razed to the ground and were forced to live in Florence. For them, however, a simple house was not enough. They built fortified palaces with square towers up to 250 feet high. Originally, there were at least 150 of these towers, and unfortunately, many of them were taken down. But Florence, but in Dante's, at least in Dante's times, must have looked much like the town of San Gimignano that attracts visitors from, from all over the world. All allies, friends and associates of the feudal lord now also became city dwellers, living in the same neighborhood of their now urbanized, urbanized lord. Together they formed a consortium, really a euphemism for a mafia. Nevertheless, nevertheless, this migration from country to town made Florence bigger in size and population. In turn, this created the problem of feeding a large population now reaching about 30,000 people. In his chronicles, Fra or Father Salimbene, Fra is a friar, says that when the news spread that the famous preacher by the name of Giovanni da Vicenza 
was coming to Florence, the Florentine said, For the sake of God, stop him. He resurrects the dead, and here not even the living have anything to eat. I mentioned, I mentioned that the now urbanized noblemen formed the Council of the 100. Now, the instruments of resistance against this oligarchy of the noblemen could be known okay, or came to be known as the arti, the arts, the, in English, the guilds, essentially association of people with the same, with the same occupation. Rather than trade unions, they were really more consortiums where the bond, rather than being the bond of blood as in the case of the nobility, was the profession or the professions, the arti as they were called. Many streets of today's Florence are still named after these arts, these arti as I said. For example, here is the palace of the arte della lana, the art of wool, which with the related coat of arms. It is here, by the way, where I officially presented my dictionary of Dante's Divine Comedy that I mentioned earlier, under the auspices of the government of Tuscany. Now, these arti, these consortiums, eventually split into arti maggiori, or major arts, and arti minori, or minor arts, as is shown in the picture. In practice, arts with juicy and rewarding positions and the arts of those who today would work at McDonald's or, or similar. Now, gradually, some of the now urbanized feudal lords joined the arti maggiori, the major arts, without undergoing the training whereby the ambitious bourgeois citizens would learn, would learn his chosen art. But there, there were also other urbanized feudal lords who did not want to stoop and to be counted among people whom they considered their inferiors, people really that had to work. We have evidence of this split, this dichotomy among the nobility, in an Italian expression that refers to someone who does not have a job nor intends to learn one. The expression is senza arte ne parte, meaning literally without an art, meaning a professional productive activity, and without a part, broadly meaning someone without objectives in the conduct of his life. Interestingly, or rather historically suggestive, the creation of the split between major arts and minor arts created what today we call, or used to call, a class conflict. The conflict ended up with internal turmoil and the temporary rise of a sort of dictatorship of the proletariat, Florentine style, we should add. The leader of this dictatorship was Giano della Bella, who, Giano, Dante places in paradise in his canto number 16, where he meets with one of his ancestors, with whom Dante discusses the causes of the decadence of the political system of Florence. In one of the chronicles of the time we find, and I quote, the nobles and wealthy citizens threw insults to the commoners, wherefore many good citizens and merchants, among whom was a great and powerful citizen, a wise, valiant and good man called Giano della Bella, strong-minded and of good lineage, who regretted these insults, became the head and guide of the insulted classes. Now, this wave of leftist radicalism gave rise to an amusing, or if you like, grotesque rhetoric made up of honorific titles turned upside down, for until then everyone was entitled to be addressed as, for example, cavaliere, meaning knight, or messere, meaning sir. Henceforth, however, the official documents during this primordial dictatorship of the, of the proletariat it became customary to add to the name in the official documents such titles as poor, miser, weak, and even imbecile and impotent, because, according to a witty modern Italian historian, the Italian vocabulary had not yet invented or incorporated the word compagno in the sense of comrade of Bolshevik and Leninist tradition. In the next episode, God's willing, I will continue to deal with episodes of Dante's life intermeshed with the history of Florence. 
In the remaining section of this episode, considering the eminent position that Dante holds in Italian poetry, I will say something about the literary poetical movement of which Dante is considered a leader. The movement, the movement actually started in France, first with the so-called, actually called, chansons de geste, or epic poems that were warlike and religious, connected with the wars that prevented the Moors from invading Europe and converting, it, and converting Europe to Islam. Then, after the First Crusade, a new school was formed in France, ironic, light, anti-clerical, and with Arabic influences. The founder was William of Poitiers, and he was an impenitent playboy, and when the Bishop of Poitiers, <coughs> who was completely bold, ordered him to dismiss his concubines, William replied, I will do so the day when you will need a comb. His daughter, Eleanor of Aquitaine, was made of the same stuff as her father first married to the King of France, Louis VII, she then married Henry Plantagenet, therefore becoming Queen of England. Historian John Butler said that Eleanor had been a bad wife, a bad mother, and a bad queen. But she inspired the model for a new courtly and earthly poetry that placed woman in the place that earlier, was, that earlier poetry had assigned to God. The new poetry, in turn, gave rise to a new breed of wandering poets who brought novelty and excitements to the French medieval courts. In Italy, this was not possible, even in Sicily, at the court of the skeptic and libertine Emperor Frederick II. A witty Italian historian said that these Sicilian noblemen, half Norman and half Arab, due to previous Norman and Arab invasions, were already Italian and furthermore Sicilian, and they viewed with great suspicion any gallant compliment directed to their wives. The place where these roaming poetical singers found acceptance was Tuscany. Here, in turn, the French school gave way, or gave rise, to an anti-school named Dolce Stil Novo, or Sweet New Deal, Sweet New Style rather, excuse me. This style removed any carnal content from love. Woman was now a symbol of perfection and elevation to God. Among other things, this enabled poets, including Dante, to write essentially passionate lines of love to their mistresses, married or otherwise, without raising suspicion of any further interests. Next time, we will return to Dante his vicissitudes in the midst of Florentine politics, how he was exiled and never returned to Florence. Until then, I am Jimmy Molia for Historical Sketches. Thank you for watching. See you next time. Good night.